Can I build a carport on my property? This is probably one of the most common questions or inquiries that we receive. In today's video, I'm going to talk through the five different options that you have available if your site is a small allotment. So stay tuned. Okay, so I mentioned before that we're going to be focusing on carports on small allotments. So the first question naturally that you're going to ask is what's a small allotment? Essentially, it's a front lot that is less than 450 square meters. Now, if you hear people talking about a 10 meter width requirement, that's old terminology. That was relevant under City Plan 2000. We're now operating under City Plan 2014, and under this document, this planning scheme, that width requirement is no longer relevant. You can ignore it. It is literally just the area requirement that we're focusing on. It also technically covers rear lots less than 600 square meters, but really, today we're gonna to focus on front lots because that's where we tend to see these inquiries the most. So, what is a small lot? It's a front lot less than 450 square meters in area. Next question, what's a carport? I know, it seems pretty basic, but there is actually some rules and requirements here. Technically, under the planning scheme, there is no definition of a carport. However, it is generally accepted that a carport is a parking structure that is enclosed on no more than two facades. Couple little tips here. If the carport is positioned within half a metre of the side boundary, then that boundary fencing is counted as an enclosure. If the carport is also positioned within half a metre of the house, that house is counted as an enclosure. So if you have the carport within half a metre of the side boundary and within half a metre of the house, you've already used up your two facades. You can't put an enclosure or a door on the front or anything on the side. However, if you sit the carport or the parking structure half a metre off the boundary and half a metre off the house, then there's nothing stopping you from putting a door on the front and enclosing the other side. It's still technically a carport. The minute you enclose more than two facades, it becomes a garage. Whole different rules for that sort of thing, totally different. We're not going to talk about that today. Today we're just talking about carports. So, they're the two questions I wanted to get over and done with to start with. As I mentioned earlier on, we're going to talk through the five different options that I personally believe that you have available. Now the first option is probably the easiest option, but no one ever likes it. The reason they don't like it is it involves a single width carport. So a maximum dimension of six meters in length and three meters in width. Now I should say here, those dimensions are measured from the outer edge of the post to the outer edge of the post. Well, basically it includes everything except the eaves, the overhangs. Now people naturally go to me, hey Peter, what's an eave? How big can an eave be? Use common sense, guys. <laughs> if you're talking, say 450, 600, yeah, that's still an eave. The minute you go over 600 in dimension, so that sort of distance, it starts to become what we classify as an awning and no longer an eave. Technically, there's no definition of what the difference is between an eave and an awning. You have to use common sense here. So as I said, as an industry, we generally operate on a basis of the minute you go over 600, that then becomes an awning and has to be included in that dimension. So you could have, like we said, single width, three meters in width, post to post, with 600 eaves on either side. So that's how you get a little bit extra. So six by three, there is no requirements in terms of siting. So you can literally stick that carport on the front boundary and on the side boundary. We could stick it over here on this side boundary. We could stick it in the middle of the property on the front boundary. Completely up to you, there is no requirements. When it comes to the crossover, so I probably should explain what a crossover is. Crossover is the portion of the driveway that sits between your allotment boundary and the curb line or the road. So basically the portion of your driveway that traverses over the council owned property. That is called a crossover. So the crossover, the width of the crossover, the neck of the driveway, can't exceed four meters. So yeah, problem, like I said, is the fact that you can only do a single width design. Bonus is that you can position it literally anywhere on the site and town planning has no say over it. The certifier will have some requirements that you need to comply with as part of the building approval process, but from a town planning perspective, you're sweet. So that's the first option, the easiest option, but no one likes it. Now we come to option number two. Now this one only applies in situations where the grade is greater than, greater than, I have to think about it, make sure I'm not doing my less than symbol, greater than one in four. So for every four meters of distance, I think you call it, you can, if you drop more than one meter in height, so 1.1 meters in height over four meters, then you qualify for this option. 
So essentially it applies to steep sites, sites where you can't reasonably get a car up to a garage or a carport or down to a carport. So in that situation, you can go a double width crossover. We're talking over here, you can only do four meters. Here you can do five, uh, six meters, I should say, whoops. <laughs> and that is because you can do a double width design. Now, when it comes to the setbacks, you can literally have it on the front boundary. However, you still need to comply with the standard setback requirements, which I will get to when we get down to this example. So that's why I've drawn this little line here to say, we'll, get, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> So just to recap, if you've got a steep site with a grade that is greater than one in four, one metre drop for every four metres of distance, then you can look at this option, which allows you to put the double width carport on the front boundary, but you still need to comply with the standard side boundary setback rules. That's option number two. Then we come to option number three. Now this option allows you again to have a double width design. However, it only applies to blocks that are greater than 15 meters in width. Let's be real, if your block is less than 450 square meters in area, if it meets that small lot definition, it's gonna be extremely rare that you'll find a situation where it's greater than 15 meters in width. Um, I should say actually greater than, that's probably a bit more technically correct. <laughs> in this situation, you can do a crossover that is 4.5, 4.5 meters in width. The problem comes in up here. So, and down here, I should say. So let's go two meter front setback and 1.5. Man, I'm impressed with myself. I'm actually remembering these dimensions off the top of my head. <laughs> okay, so you do a double width carport. By the way, those triangles, they're meant to be cars. Roll with me here. <laughs> okay, so you can be two meters off the front boundary, 1.5 off the side boundary, but only on allotments that are greater than 15 meters in width. And it allows you to have a crossover up to 4.5. See, on this example, you do actually need that extra six meters in width because it's hard to manoeuvre a car from a standard four meter wide crossover directly into a double width carport. Yeah, <laughs> it's fun to dance here. Um, but when you've got two meters distance between the boundary and the actual parking structure, you can go from a reduced crossover and manoeuvre into that double width. One more constraint on this one I should have mentioned, and that is the entire site cover so the ratio of roof area to site area cannot exceed 50%. That's the other, so I guess, rule requirement, stipulation, that's a better word, stipulation you've got there. So single width carport, double width where your grade is greater than one in four, double width where your block width is greater than 15. Next example we come to down here. So this rule or this option here talks about complying with the building envelope requirements. So essentially you need to comply with council's standard side setback and front setback requirements. Now, stick with me here, this is a little bit complex. Let's start with the front boundary setback. It needs to be between three and six meters, but it's based on your neighbors. So if your neighbors are set back a minimum of three meters, or if they're closer than three meters to the boundary, you can go three meters off your front boundary. If your neighbors are six meters or more from the front boundary, you can go a minimum of six meters. These are all minimum dimensions I'm talking here for you. If your neighbors fall between somewhere in three and six meters, you can go as far forward as them. Let me just go back and say this again. So your setback needs to range from at least three meters up to a minimum of six meters, depending on what neighbors you have. If your neighbors are closer than three meters to the front boundary, you can go as far forward as three meters. If your neighbors are six meters or more off the front boundary, you can go as close as six meters. You can go further if you want. Why would you? No one ever does, <laughs> unless it's a really weird site. And if your neighbors, whichever neighbor you wanna pick off, if one of them is closer than or within that three to six meter mark, you can go as far forward as them, but you can't go any further forward than them. So like I said, ranges from three to six meters and you still comply with the building envelope requirements. Now, this is where it gets a bit complex. The first option here, what do we have? Let's start with 0 0.5, that's a nice easy one. So you need to be 0.5 meters off the side boundary up to a height of three meters. So, sorry, I should say 3.5. Yeah, almost got that wrong. Whew. So if you're half a meter off the boundary and your wall for your carport or your height of your carport on that boundary is no more than 3.5 meters in height, sweet. If you want to go as an alternative, zero meters, you can, let me just write a few numbers down. 
three meters um, within one meter. Okay, let me explain this here. Let me jump over this side. If your site is positioned within the low density residential zone or the character residential zone two, so sub precinct two, which is the infill precinct, not character residential one, then you can go zero meters on the side boundary when you have neighbor's written support and that neighbor's written support needs to be in the form of a statutory, oh, that's a mouthful, statutory declaration. There we go. The wall can't exceed three meters in height and you can't be positioned within one meter of any habitable windows on the neighbor's property. So that one, yeah, technically you could probably get zero meters off the boundary as of right. It's very hard. There's a lot of uh, hoops you've got to jump through to actually tick that box. So I'll just say that again. You need the neighbor's written support in the form of a stat deck. You need to be no more than three meters in height and you need to make sure that your wall is not within one meter of any habitable windows. So kitchens, bath, not bathrooms, sorry, kitchens, lounges, bedrooms, they're all habitable rooms. So not within one meter of any of those rooms or windows to those rooms on the neighbor's property. And it needs to be only LDR or CR2 zone. It can't be the CR1 and that's, I'll be honest, most of the inquiries that we receive are for the CR1 zone. So that's why we can't actually utilize that requirement there. So more often than not, what you end up being is you have to be half a meter off the boundary, no more than three meters in height. That height can be a problem if you've got a sloping site, because obviously a wall starts to get bigger at the back of the property as it slopes away from the road, etc., etc. Now we had a four meter crossover here. So again, you've got another small crossover, but because you're going from a, or you've got a larger set back there, it's not too bad, it's not too scary, you can make that work. Now, option number five, we come to. Each one of these here that we've talked about is covered by exemptions. It doesn't actually trigger the need for a town planning approval. You can go for your life. You still need building approval. Don't go too crazy. You need to certify a sign off. This option here essentially involves lodging a town planning application. Lodging a development application to get council's approval to do something that isn't covered in these first four options. So you can literally do whatever you like in terms of crossover widths. Generally speaking, council doesn't like to go over 4.5 anyway. Sometimes they'll go up to five meters. And back in the old days, when I say the old days, under the old planning scheme, it was quite common for us to seek approval for six meter wide crossovers. Council was happy with it. They were throwing it around, they were happy. Unfortunately, like I said, these days, they tend to be a lot more tight on those rules and requirements. They don't like to go over 4.5. If you're really lucky, you can get five meters. It's really gonna come down to what's in the street. So if you look up and down your street and you see a heap of double width crossovers that are all six meters in width, yeah, that gives you a lot more chance. If you look up and down the street and everyone's got single width crossovers, yeah, you're gonna to struggle to get anything bigger than that there. Um, in terms of setbacks, okay, so these meet the acceptable solutions or the exemptions. This one technically triggers assessment against the performance outcome. So when council looking at the performance outcome, they're looking at a few different things. Number one, consistency with the street. So if you look up and down the street within your block, if you can find two, ideally three, two is probably okay, examples of other properties where they've built carports in the same sort of position as you're proposing. So by that, I mean, if you wanna go on the front boundary, they're on the front boundary. If you wanna go on the side boundary, they're on the side boundary. If you can find those examples, ideally also small lots, then that's good. You tick that box, happy days. If you're relying on examples in the street behind, the street down the road, or a couple of blocks down the road, council's not gonna consider those. They need to be within the immediate streetscape. In other words, the block that you're within, and ideally on your side of the road, and ideally just to put another criterion out there on small allotments. So that's the first thing council looks at. Second thing council looks at is the amenity impacts on your neighbors, access to daylight, sunlight, privacy, all of that sort of stuff. If you can go to your neighbors and you can get a letter of support off them, that shows that there's not gonna be any impacts on them. Obviously, they're not gonna provide a letter of support if they're concerned about what you're doing next door. But don't get too excited. I reckon probably 75, 80% of the time, people respond to me and go, yeah, yeah, I've known Joan next door for years. We're best mates, we're sweet. He'll give me a letter of support, no worries. Yeah, more often than not, unfortunately, they come back and they say, yeah, so I went home, chat to him on the weekend. He surprised me, he's not happy with it. Unfortunately, people, they get bogged down in detail. They start looking at everything else you're doing on the site. They fail to realize you're only asking them to comment on the carport. They start to think about all the potential impacts and it just doesn't go to plan. So don't automatically assume that you will get your neighbor's support or the client that will get the neighbor's support. 
because unfortunately, as I said, track record shows that more often than not, people freak out when they get asked for support and they just don't provide those letters. So just talk them through it. Make sure they realize that you're only seeking approval. Let's say you wanna go on the boundary, you're only seeking approval for a half a meter reduction. Say you wanna go on the front boundary, it's only three to six meter reduction. Just explain to them that what the alternative is, is one of these four examples. So it's not as if they're approving your carport in, that, in the front of the property. What they're approving is a slight reduction in the front or the side boundary setbacks, or a slight increase in the crossover width, all of that sort of stuff. So just explain that to them so that they understand what they're actually commenting on. What do we talked about? Consistency, amenity. Okay, next thing to look at is what is next door. So if you're planning to do a carport here and right next door is another carport, yeah, we've got a good situation. Or if you're planning to do a carport here and there's a bucket load of dense mature vegetation next door, happy days. If you're doing a carport and you've got someone's primary open space next door, a space where they spend a lot of time sitting around, trying to absorb the sunlight, trying to chat to each other, yeah, that, that's a little bit harder. <laughs> it's a bit hard to argue that you won't impact on their amenity, their access to sunlight, daylight, privacy, all of that sort of stuff, if they've got a decent area at the front there. So as I said, vegetation, parking structures, pathways, things where people can't actually sit for extended periods of time, that's a massive advantage. So I think that covers all the performance solutions. Yes, all the things we look at when we're actually trying to justify this option to council. One thing to keep in mind is you're still gonna be up for some crazy costs and timeframes when it comes to these sorts of applications. If you can demonstrate there's a bucket load of examples in the street, the neighbors are on board, then there's a good chance that RiskSmart, which is council's fast track process, will take the application on. That means you get a 20% discount on council's fee, which brings their fee down below $500, and it means you get the approval within one to two weeks. If you've watched some of our previous videos, you would have heard me say that people will often throw out the term five business days, Technically that five business days doesn't start ticking until they've receipted your money. There's a few things that has to happen before we get to that point. So I always like to say one to two weeks. If however, you have issues with demonstrated compliance with the performance outcomes. So if you don't have examples in the street or you don't have neighbor support, to be honest, I probably wouldn't lodge it for you because I think I'd be wasting your time and money. But if it's, it's not quite eligible for risk smart, but it's just over the border or the threshold, then you'd go via the team. That's where you're looking at full council fees and probably two to three months as a guide in council. So yes, the council fees are not too huge, but once you add on the cost for getting the plans prepared to a standard that's actually suitable for town planning, keeping in mind that the plans that the certifier needs and the plans that council needs from a town planning perspective are totally different. These ones can be very, very basic. These ones need to have a lot of pretty pictures and things in them. So once you account for the cost of getting the plans done, the council fees, the fees to get a private town planner to do the actual job for you, it starts to go up and up and up. And as I said, if you're going by the team, you look at two to three months, it's a big time frame. So when you consider that, and you consider the risks involved, like I said, if you don't have neighbor support, if you don't have examples in your street, again, I stress the fact that they have to be the immediate streetscape, not the block down the road, then you need to actually look at one of these four examples here because these ones are givens. They're ones that you can do automatically. You don't need to worry about council approval for those things. This one does have the extra cost, timeframes and risk. Uh, what else do I need to say? So we've covered those overlays and neighborhood plans. Okay, what we've talked about here today is just focusing on the small lot rules. I've not considered the overlays, like the traditional building character overlay, specifically the local character significance sub precinct. I haven't considered any of the neighborhood plans. Those two different things, the overlays and the neighborhood plans can completely change all of these rules and requirements. So you need to consider those separately if they apply to the property. Like I said, we're just looking at small lots, lots less than 450 square meters for a front lot in this situation. I think that covers everything I wanted to say. If you're interested in looking at carports or if you've got a client that's interested in a carport and you're not quite sure whether it would actually qualify like for risk smart or whether it might qualify for a team application what the chances of success are why not just send it through we don't need to see plans you can just sit there and say hey i'm planning to do a double width carport on the front boundary on the side boundary on the left hand side etc etc just give us a verbal run through and i'm more than happy to give you my honest feedback to be as i said before i will not lodge an application unless i think it has a high chance of success it's just, it's not fun for me. It's not good for my reputation. It's not good for you. It makes it me hard to sleep at night, all of that sort of stuff. I have no interest in doing it, basically. 
So if you want some honest feedback on the potential for your next job, why not get in touch? Just send us an email. Until next time, thanks for watching. For all you red tape lovers out there, I have one thing to say. Well, no, actually, I've got three. Number one, the advice provided in these videos is general in nature. It's not site specific. You would be a silly billy to go and make financial decisions based on this advice without first checking with the town planner. Don't be a silly billy. Number two, Brisbane Town Planning is in no way linked to Brisbane City Council. The views expressed in these videos are my own, not council's. So if you don't like them, blame me, not council. Number three, what was my number three? Oh yeah, the views expressed in these videos are accurate at the time of recording. If you're watching this video back 10 years from now, the views may not be so accurate. That's all.